the endless flat horizon of the Kalahari is broken in eastern Botswana by a range of rocky hills. A pair of black eagles soars near the largest range of hills, known as Swapong. Their aerobatics declare their attraction and bond to each other. These are the most accomplished aviators in the eagle world. The black eagle rules the skies over Swapong. Eagles still soar over Botswana villages, where life continues in the rural tradition. The Swapong Hills are surrounded by many villages, but the hills themselves are uninhabited because of the presence of powerful spirits. Gorges cutting deep into the hills are believed to be home to the spirits of the ancestors of the Botswana people, the Badimo. The Badimo live at the head of each gorge. The villagers are afraid of the spirits and leave the sacred gorges untouched. So the black eagle lives and breeds in an undisturbed sanctuary. The most sacred part of the gorge is at the head, where pure water bursts from the bare rock. The sacred hills of Swapong lie to the east of Botswana. The surrounding flatlands suddenly give way to sheer cliffs hundreds of feet high. Updrafts lift the eagles effortlessly into the sky. The black eagle is a large and powerful predator. The cliff's other residents are rightfully wary of it. But for the moment, the eagle doesn't have hunting on its mind. Red cliffs, washed white, reveal the roosts of the cliff's largest resident, the Cape Vulture. Smaller and more inaccessible ledges provide nest sites for hundreds of other birds, like swifts and starlings, and offer a degree of protection from predators, but not from the artful Gymnogene, the sneak thief of the cliff face. The Gymnogene reaches the parts other predators cannot reach. Rocky terrain attracts a wide variety of specialized residents. Chakma baboons are fantastic rock climbers. They keep an eye on their territory from lookout posts where they bask in the morning sun. Hyraxes use the rocks like radiators in the cold mornings. and the myriad crevices are occupied by a myriad crevice dwellers. This long-nosed insect eater is an elephant shrew. Although it's only a few inches long, it is fast and agile 
and colonizes all the rocky areas. Crevice and Cliff are home to a range of wildlife unlike any other in Botswana. A couple of hours of morning sun warms the cliffs enough to raise thermals for the vultures to soar on. Once the vultures reach the top of the thermal, they peel off and head across the arid plain in search of carrion. Eight-foot wings carry them with grace and speed. But the short ledges call for a sudden stop. One hundred and fifty pairs of vultures roost in the hills, and competition for the best ledges is fierce. For a short while, their numbers will be growing. They're about to raise their young, and all efforts are concentrated on mating and nest building. The search for nesting material takes them to the wooded base of the cliffs. Here, they deliberate over the perfect stick, usually the one in another vulture's beak. Nests soon fill the cramped ledges. Nest refinement is an ongoing activity, and extra material can always be found nearby. Vultures become so concerned with the exact placement of sticks that they don't notice where the rest of the nest is heading. Although Cape vultures are highly sociable birds, competition is intense at this time of year, and they must guard their nest sites fiercely. The black eagle usually hunts small mammals, but an easy meal is always welcome. They regularly survey the vultures' cliffs for unprotected eggs and nestlings. These raids are more common when the eagles have young to feed. A pair of eagles will alternate between two or three nest sites over the years. This nest is built in a hillside baobab tree. As usual, two eggs were laid and two hatched, but the older chick has done away with the younger. Both parents feed and hunt for it during the 14 weeks it stays in the nest. The chick's appetite will keep them busy for most of each day. A 
as well as fresh meat, the adults bring fresh greenery to line the nest and shade the chick from the sun. The eagles are not the only ones searching for greenery on the hills. A medicine man collects ingredients for traditional medicines. Pods, bark, leaves or roots. He only takes what he needs and never destroys the plants in the process. The unique environment found within the hills offers water and shelter to plants that grow nowhere else in Botswana. The hills are renowned throughout southern Africa for the special plants that grow here. Many fruiting trees grow on the hillsides and the fruit is an important part of the local diet. Swapong has long been a valuable resource to the people of this land. Ancestors left rock paintings perhaps more than 2,000 years ago. Ancient iron smelting sites and paraphernalia are scattered throughout the hills. Some of these date back more than 1,500 years. And thousands of pottery shards litter the ground, making this one of the most important prehistoric sites in southern Africa. Today, the tops of the hills, away from the sacred gorges, are still used to gather thatching grass for the surrounding villages. The villages are not far from the base of the hills. Water flows out to them year-round, and life is good. The Badimo guide the people, bring them rain, and cure their illnesses through the medicine men. A recent incident strengthened beliefs in the Badimo, if they needed strengthening at all. Sir Saretsi Kama was the founding president of modern Botswana and a descendant of a long line of Botswana chiefs. When he died, a great rock crashed from this cliff into the river below. The gorges are sacred and run deep into the hills. The permission of local chiefs is needed before anyone can enter them. A few miles away is the arid Kalahari, but here trickling water produces lush and delicate greenery. The pools at the head of the gorges are especially sacred. Here, great snakes protect the Badimo. Green gorges are the home to much of the unexpected wildlife of Swapong. Tall forest trees line the high cliffs of the gorges, creating a shady retreat. Some of these trees are found nowhere else in Botswana. Fig trees are laden with fruit like a garden of Eden. And vervet monkeys thrive in the thick vegetation, gathering fruit from the trees and enjoying shelter from the sun. Water also emerges from rocks outside the gorges.
Wherever it appears, it is considered sacred. And to have healing properties. And in a desert, water is simply the source of all life. The hot, noisy cliffs of the vultures above seem a world apart. Squabbles still erupt over nest sites. Many pairs have not found suitable sites, even though others have laid eggs. Where the eggs have hatched, the adults are busy tending the young. Latecomers have only the less desirable ledges left to them, or none at all. Nests are packed onto and into every nook and cranny, and they provide excellent cover for the insects this shrew is after. The elephant shrew gets its name from its long, flexible nose. Although it looks like a mouse, it's an insect eater, more closely related to bats. The vulture chicks will spend almost five months on the ledge before fledging. At this age, they're seldom left alone for long, as they're vulnerable to airborne attack. The adults are keen-eyed, wary, and very protective of their young. They can growl at the eagles, but they can't outmaneuver them. The eagle needs to find meat for its young, but these chicks are well guarded. Vulture chicks aren't a staple of the eagle's diet. That position is taken by the hyrax. These curious looking primitive mammals are unlikely relatives of the elephant. They occur widely across Africa, always found on the same rocky terrain as black eagles. And it's here that the eagles, often hunting as a pair, like to surprise them. They build up speed on the far side of the hill, then swoop over the crest to surprise whatever lies in their path. But their plans are foiled by a Franklin. So the pair separates. A Hyrax lookout takes up the alarm cry but it hasn't seen the other eagle approaching from behind. Once warm, hyraxes can run fast, and they scatter over the rocks looking for cover between the boulders. to wait a while before hunting this hillside again. Swapong is home to wildlife great and small. 
a beautiful gallery of rust-colored rocks, provides canvases for abstract patterns of lichens. In the heat of the day, some of the smaller animals emerge to forage. Mocking chats are on the hunt for insects. Flat lizards lie in wait for a meal. It's all a matter of scale and scales. A fallen boulder becomes a great cliff for an armor-plated rock climber. A male flat lizard called a platysaurus, displays his striking livery. His brightly colored underside proclaims his territory to other males. Always on the lookout for a juicy meal, the shrew scouts the insect-filled crevices. But it needs to be careful. Many other animals would consider the shrew a tasty meal. These are the coils of the venomous puff adder, and its main prey is small, warm-blooded mammals. It can sense body heat in special pits on its head, so it can track the shrew without actually seeing it. The fascinated flat lizards become animated by the puff adder's progress. They jolt and jar, as the adder flows in liquid locomotion. But they can't afford to get distracted. Small reptiles are the favored prey of many of the hawks, eagles, and falcons that live in Swapong. In fact, Swapong is a bird of prey paradise. Rock kestrels are particularly partial to small lizards. They have their own territory to defend and are agitated by the presence of the black eagle. When eagles get too close, the feisty kestrels think nothing of going on the attack. The message is clear. This side of the cliff is Kestrel territory. The harried eagle moves on. It must still find food for its young. It spots a chance and plans a sudden attack. Storming through the skies, it strikes with ease. The rock pigeon was cornered and didn't stand a chance. takes the pigeon down to a tree in the gorge to be plucked before returning to the chick. The bottoms of the gorges stay green year-round thanks to the constant supply of water percolating through the rocks. 
most of the wildlife in the hills is linked to this miraculous resource. Clouds rising above the range drop rain on the hilltops, which soaks down through the soft rock. When it reaches harder rock, it bursts from the cliffs. Water is the sacred heart of Swapong, and Swapong is a rare oasis in the arid Kalahari. A goat-sized antelope is perfectly adapted for life in the rocky hills. The clipspringer tiptoes like a ballet dancer on points across near vertical rock faces. Unusual springy hair gives it a dense coat that protects it from heat, cold and sharp rocks. Clipspringers and their young are vulnerable to predators both from the air and the ground. Attack from the black eagle is a very real threat to the lamb. When threatened, the lamb retreats to long grass and stays still. Adults can outrun most land animals on the steep rocks, even the powerful leopard. Surprisingly, some leopards still live in the thickly wooded gorges, despite the closeness of the Botswana villages. Baboons are preyed on by both eagle and leopard and don't appreciate either as neighbors. Leopards are shy of humans and hide themselves in the depths of the hills. They're seldom seen. Like the eagles, they are unintentionally protected by the villagers' fear of the spirits. Once the panic has died down, the baboons return to their foraging in the woods and cliffs. They're nimble and confident on the rock faces. The rocks are refuges for numerous small animals that the baboons can feed on. They can also find water high up in the cliffs. The gymnogene uses the cover of the woods to raise its young. The female makes final adjustments to the loosely made nest while she incubates her eggs. This unusual hawk is a one-off, the only member of its family. Its body is well adapted to its hunting habits, long legs, a small head, and an unusually lightweight frame hidden beneath its gray plumage. It can display in a manner that seems quite shameful, a coy blush. The name Jimnogene means bare cheeks, but the meaning of the facial display is not clear. It is common when a mated pair is near to each other or is excited. After two months, the eagle chick has grown substantially and feathers are breaking through its down. This time, the hyrax hunt was more successful. On the cliff face, the vulture colony is bursting at the seams. (laughs) 
rapidly growing chicks occupy nearly all the ledges. They may be young, but some already have four-foot wingspans and even bigger appetites. Every crack and crevice is alive with breeding birds. Red-winged starlings sandwich nests into the narrowest fissures, while swifts glue theirs underneath. But no crack is too narrow or inaccessible for the gymnogene. Broad wings enable it to float up and down the cliffs with ease. Its lightweight body lets it hang onto the bare rock. Its small head pries tiny gaps, while its long flexible legs fish nestlings out of the deepest holes. The starling's desperate protests won't distract the hawk for long. The gymnogene knows the nestlings are here and will be back. It has a chick to feed. Vervet monkeys are too big to be caught by gymnogenes. They're still at risk from the much larger eagles. They spend much of their time in the thick cover of the trees. Like the eagle chick, this gymnogene hatchling has done away with its sibling and demands constant feeding. Its parents won't return empty-handed. A second dash at the cliffs was successful and the parent presents a starling. The gymnogene chick is in no danger from the troop of monkeys below. They're mainly vegetarian and scar the forest for ripe fruit. And there always seems to be something in fruit throughout the year. With a harvest as abundant as this, the vervets can afford to be fussy about what they eat. They reject all but the choicest fruit. The platysaurus is also interested in the fruit, although it doesn't find it easy to eat. And a plated lizard, a fuller-bodied relation, is taken with the fruit too.
Many of the animals vary their diets to take advantage of these opportunities. The shrew welcomes a free lunch. Everything comes to the lizard that waits. A furry army of caterpillars is on maneuvers, and the lizard knows just how to maneuver them to get their poisonous hair off. With lunch taken care of, he spends some time attracting the opposite sex. Perhaps he should have taken a longer lunch. Bright colors aren't confined to the lizards. Spectacular aloes grow along the cliffs and gorges. Their fiery flowers brighten the landscape and provide food for nectar sippers and blossom eaters. Some plants act as larders for a whole host of dainty tree squirrels. until the dainty tree squirrel ends up in the larder of the gymnogene. The chick is almost big enough to feed itself and might make a better job of it. Its parent has lost the little corpse in the loosely formed nest, much to the annoyance of the chick which impatiently watches the rescue operation. The adult seems taken aback by the nestling's outbursts, but remains intent on retrieving the hard-gained squirrel. This is where multi-jointed legs come in handy. A moment of hope or frustration, but it looks like the remains of the little squirrel have gone for good. Perhaps it's time to make another visit to the cliffside larder. More and more hyraxes make the one-way journey to the black eagle's nest. At three and a half months, the youngster is the size of an adult, but looks very different. It won't get its adult plumage for another four or five years. But in a few more weeks, it will fledge and take to the skies over Swapong. The vulture chicks are almost fully grown too. Just making the way to a roost is a hazardous affair and risks running the gauntlet of sharp beak and striking claw. A pair that hasn't bred yet tries to take over a ledge from an almost fully grown chick. Amazingly, the youngster manages to fend them off until its parent saves the day. It 
won't be long before the chick can fly and fend for itself. But some chicks will never fly. They're afflicted with osteodystrophy, a bone disease similar to rickets. The environment beyond the hills is changing. Vultures can't always find enough bone chips to keep their young healthy. The eagles will soon discover any weakness, and with this disease, there are no second chances. There was no way the chick could have survived stranded on the ledge. And now there's one more space in the crowded colony. The dead vulture chick is too heavy to carry, so the eagle eats it where it's fallen. Cape vultures are long-lived birds. The infant mortality rate is high, but they have many years to make up the numbers. A ruckus has broken out in the baboon troop. An unknown male has just walked into the wrong territory. The stranger's presence threatens the standing of the dominant male in the troop. He is not welcome. The troop's dominant male stood his ground and drove the intruder off. A clip springer nervously inspects the cause of the commotion. But the excitement is over and the victorious male is groomed by his appreciative troop. This gentle activity reaffirms their rank and relationships. Excited youngsters can't keep their energy down and start to play. Finally, all remaining tension is dispelled.
the end of each day finds the villagers in their homes. In the traditional huts, everyone heads inside, and not just because it's dinner time. The spirits of the ancestors are active after dark. Villagers extinguish fires outside, so the spirits don't burn their feet in the night. Anything else active at night is associated with the spirits and is to be feared. This giant cricket is watched with a mixture of nervousness and fascination. In fact, the villagers fear all nocturnal animals, no matter how large or small. The brown hyena means no harm to humans. It's just after an easy meal, maybe some bones or a scrap of skin. Despite their fear of the dark, some people actually head for the hills at night. Swapong is a sacred place to nearby residents of all faiths. A Christian sect climbs up the hills to pray. service will last till dawn and when the morning brings rain their beliefs will be all the stronger The sacred presence of Swapong is waning. Already the sacred gorges and hilltops are being used for cattle grazing. The hills can't support large-scale grazing and the disturbance in the fragile gorges will drive out indigenous wildlife. Times are changing in the villages. Modern houses are built now, and technology has been embraced by some. If technology becomes the new religion, then Swapong's spirits may be forgotten. And if they are, who will protect the wildlife? Swapong is unique in Botswana. Its microclimate brings rain clouds and mists to the edge of the Kalahari. Its inaccessibility, its water and sacred significance have allowed specialized wildlife to flourish for thousands of years. And this year, the vulture colony has flourished. The last chicks are fledging, testing their eight-foot wings on the breeze. Soon, they will make the leap that will free them from the crowded cliffs and open up the lands beneath them. To the ancient Egyptians, the vulture was the symbol of longevity. Its outstretched wings adorning temple doorways. Let's hope that the vultures on Swapong symbolize its longevity in a changing world. Swapong does survive, its rulers have an heir to succeed them. 
As the young eagle sheds its juvenile brown feathers for regal black, she will learn the graceful and agile flight of her parents. Hopefully, the timeless battle between eagle and vulture will continue, like the timeless battle between technology and tradition. If the thirst for knowledge can be tempered with respect for the past, then Swapong will remain the sacred haunt of eagles. This is a vision of Africa as we imagine it to be. But this is the exception, not the rule. Such a pristine sanctuary is rarely found in today's Africa. This is a special oasis where wildlife is isolated, never managed or controlled by man. Here, Endangered animals like the wild dog thrive in greater numbers and larger packs than anywhere else in Africa. This place is a window on the past, Africa as it used to be. But where is this rare oasis? It's on an island in Botswana. Large tracts of Kalahari Sandveld part the waters of the Okavango Delta to form wooded islands. The largest and most isolated of these lies in the Delta's heart, Chief's Island. Traditionally, it was the exclusive hunting ground for the chief of the Batawana tribe, but was seldom hunted because of its remoteness. Today, its 500 square miles make up part of the Maremi Game Reserve. And the only hunting that happens here now is by the predators of the island. Chief's Island is the heart of the Okavango, an echo of Africa as it used to be. The cool twilight hours of dawn and dusk provide the best hunting on Chief's Island. So this is the time when most predators are active. Lions are a major predator on the island and each lion has its own preference of what and when it hunts. Some are just setting out Others have been busy all night. Cheetah and wild dog hunt mainly by daylight. So dawn brings the first chance to scout the island for prey. The elephant is one of the few animals that the predators ignore. Antelope and zebra feed in the rich grasslands night and day. They need to stay in the open if they're to catch a glimpse of approaching danger. Shallow floodplains skirt the island, but present no problem to the nimble dogs. It's the deeper channels they must be wary of. Venturing across these can be a one-way journey. The jackal's barks mean that large predators are on the prowl. The grazing animals are tuned to the hunter's moves, so it's a constant effort for predators to surprise them.
heads slung low, the dogs stalk as one, sizing up their chances. The wildebeest have strength in numbers. and can withstand the dog's taunts if they stick together. Perhaps this is just a warm-up. The morning light reveals three young lions feeding on an adult Cape buffalo. They also killed the buffalo's calf, but eventually had to abandon it to the hyenas so they could feed on the adult. The arrival of a large male lion brings new problems. Few predators give up the chance of a free meal, and the strong male can easily assert his authority. It took the young lions most of the night to bring down the buffalo. They'll be reluctant to let it go. But it's clear that the male won't share with scavenger or kin. Except for a younger male associate who claims the calf for himself. The young lions are powerless against the mature male. They won't fight him for the carcass, and he won't give them the chance to try. Alone with two kills, the younger male is faced with a dilemma. He can't eat both at once, but his instincts won't let either go. The return of the large male scatters the scavengers and puts an end to the game of cat and mouse. Young lions take a chance and return to the kill. Once the males start to eat, they may become more tolerant. So far, so good, but they're still cautious. A sixth lion enters the scene, the mother of the three youngsters, easily recognizable by her half tail. Lions are instinctively protective of their kills, and strength overrules family ties. Their old mother approaches with caution.
This is not a pretty picture of family life, but it is typical lion behavior. The young adults won't admit their aging mother until they've eaten enough to satisfy their initial hunger. The conflict has attracted attention. And they're driven off once again. The dominant male cannot eat the whole buffalo, but he needs to assert his authority. He eats first, and when he's satisfied his hunger, the younger lions will be allowed to return. They will wait until the mature male is ready. And until her young are ready, the mother waits too. When she's near them, she remains submissive and cautious. This waiting game may last for hours. but the hyenas will wait the longest. Compared to the lions, the wild dogs are even tempered and cooperative. They hunt as a group, share their kill, and even take food back to feed their injured. Their success as hunters relies on this cooperation, and hunting in a large pack gives them the strength to overpower animals much bigger than themselves. The dogs stay alert as they travel through the shallows. Crocodiles take many dogs, but the reptile needs deep water to drown them. If the water is deep enough for hippos, then it's definitely deep enough for crocodiles, and the dogs take the long way round. Hippos are fiercely territorial, but sometimes they take their duties a little too far. Egyptian geese retreat to the scanty protection of some floating foliage.
The very large packs of wild dogs found on Chief's Island are a formidable force. They act as individuals and as a pack to outwit and overwhelm their prey. Kudu have sharp hearing, but the dogs stalk in silence. Once they've targeted their prey, they seldom give up. Death comes swiftly when it's dealt by so many blows. Rows of sharp teeth open up the kudu's belly and rip out its vital organs. It happens so quickly that the kudu dies in seconds. The lion's suffocating bite looks cleaner, but may take more than half an hour to have the same effect. The wild dogs gorge themselves. They're also feeding for their puppies back at the den. Once they're full, they return straight to the den. In stark contrast to the hunt, Life here is noisy. Yelping puppies eagerly greet the adults and lick their muzzles to encourage regurgitation. The adults find it impossible to resist them. Guardians look after the puppies while the other adults hunt. They also beg for food and get the same response. The puppies soon learn to protect their food from each other. Adults often play. Strong social bonds tie them together. Hooded vultures are a fact of life around the den and live in close association with the dogs. As well as clearing up the scraps and waste, the vultures provide a constant source of amusement and amusement for the pups. Play fighting at this early age tests their strength and helps set their rank in later life. The dominant female suckles all the young even if they're not her own. She may suckle as many as 18. The morning is heating up and the dogs are full. They've eaten well and may not need to hunt again today. Calm settles on the pack as they drift off in the dappled sun. The hyenas are still waiting, but seem relaxed. At last, the young lions have let their mother onto the kill. Buffalo can weigh up to a ton, 
so there's enough to feed all the lions, if they let each other feed. It'll be a few hours yet before the hyenas get a look in at the carcass. A pair of cheetahs warm themselves on a termite mound as they scan the floodplains for prey. Red lechwe, a type of swamp antelope, are prolific in the floodplains around the island. But they're easily spooked and can leap quickly through the shallow waters. A higher termite mound provides a better view. The delta and islands are studded with the slowly growing mounds, which provide the only dry ground and cover at the height of the floods. At the moment, the open floodplains seem distinctly lacking in cheetah prey. Northern Botswana is famed for the largest free-ranging herds of African elephant. It's estimated that over 100,000 elephants populate these lands, more than 15% of the whole African population. In the wet season, the elephants roam the surrounding Mapane woodlands. But in the dry season, they move into the delta to take advantage of the lush foraging on the islands. But elephants can be very destructive to their habitat. Some believe that Botswana is already overpopulated by elephants, and the government faces a dilemma. Should they allow controlled hunting or culling in order to protect this pristine habitat? A habitat up to now unregulated by man. The annual floodwaters from the Okavango and fertilizer deposited by huge herds of elephants, buffalo and antelope keep the floodplains fertile. And each year, as the waters recede, a fresh supply of food is revealed. Chakma baboons pick their way through the exposed beds of grained lagoons, collecting the tubers of slowly sinking water lilies to eat. Water lilies pepper the waterways with thousands of pink stars and provide the main source of food for the pygmy goose. This beautiful water bird is tied to the lily-covered backwaters where it feeds on the seeds of the submerged lily fruit. Water lilies aren't just a source of food, they're a habitat in their own right for jacanas, or more aptly, the lily trotter. Only the males bring up the young, while the females mate and lay eggs with a succession of others. The chicks are mobile from hatching but are vulnerable on the exposed pads. When they're under threat, the adult exhibits a remarkable defense strategy. only to deposit the chicks when danger has passed.
These lily lagoons are just one of the many unspoiled habitats that make Chiefs Island so special and sustain such a wide range of wildlife. Most of the wildlife on the island is dependent on water, so the shores of the major channels are busy with life's essential routines, drinking, feeding, and raising young. Crocodiles are plentiful in the deep channels. They ambush their prey by stealth, approaching an inch at a time until they're ready to strike. Baboons are often targets for crocodiles, so they spend very little time in the water. This one is rooted to the spot. Its troop is unnerved by its behavior. The baboon's leg is held fast in the jaws of a crocodile. But since the floodwaters have subsided, the channel is too shallow to drown the ape. When danger is out of sight, it's often out of mind. The crocodile releases the highly stressed baboon, expecting it to be drowned. And it hasn't escaped without injury. It probably lost a lot of blood in the water and looks like it's in shock. crocodile moves to deeper water. Baboons are one of the most plentiful mammals on the island, and crocodiles have taken many at this point. The crocodiles are only dangerous while they're lurking in the water. Their relationship with baboons on land is very different. After a warning bark, the baboons continue their daily routine, almost oblivious to the reptile. They seem more concerned with something stalking the other side of the inlet. Injured baboon retreats to the island's woods. The spotted hyena heads in the same direction. Although Chief's Island is now part of the Moremi Game Reserve, its wildlife is not controlled or maintained by man. Wildlife flourishes here as it has always done giving us a glimpse of an ancient Africa. There's a natural balance between predator and prey, and their instincts are honed to respond to each other's every move. The lions have broken cover to drink, 
so they give up the chance to surprise the wildebeest. But they wouldn't be in the open if they'd intended to attack. Everywhere the lion pride walks, the prey animals read the signals and assess the risk of danger. Lions seem to miss a lot of opportunities, but they only hunt when they have a reasonable chance of success. These kudu bulls are as wary of predators as the wildebeest. They see the lion's approach and move on. Prey animals escape predators more often than we think. Cheetahs hunt the same ground as lions, but specialize in smaller prey like impala and young lechwe. But this pair has not been successful today. Adult zebra are too large for the small cheetahs, but there may be foals amongst the herd. Often, cheetahs walk boldly up to their prey, relying on their speed to overhaul their victim when the chase begins. Some of the zebras spot the cheetah and watch for signs. The cheetah targets the other end of the herd. But there are no foals here, and an adult is beyond the cheetah's strength. It must look for smaller prey somewhere else. The second cheetah is nervous. Lions have settled down nearby. There's no point hunting when lions are around. They steal the kills of smaller predators, especially cheetahs. Cheetahs are in direct competition with the other predators on the island. but they're at the small end of the scale. Even the wild dogs use their numbers to harass cheetahs. Most lions avoid the strain of hunting in the heat of midday. Instead, they take time to relax. They're not under threat by any predator. Giraffes are very common on the island and use their long necks and short horns to spar. When fighting in earnest, their heads become powerful battering rams capable of killing an opponent. But mostly they engage in stylized mock fights. Lion cubs seem unaffected by the heat that overpowers their family. Suckling is one of the few activities the adults have energy for. Suckling doesn't keep cubs busy for long. They want to play.
In every little snarl and every tiny strike, the cubs are honing their hunting skills. It's hard to believe that one day they'll be wrestling with the backs of buffalo. For now, it's just a little rough and tumble. Shuddering hyphene palm sheds its fruit. This is no earthquake, but the skilled manipulation of a strong trunk. A few elephants become particularly skillful with this operation. Each falling nut is about the size of a cricket ball and just as hard. The nutritious outer husk is highly prized by elephant bulls, and large numbers invade the palm groves each year to shake down the ripening crop. Chief's Island is a piece of the Kalahari sandveld, isolated amidst the Okavango's floodwaters. Although its sandy soil is light and dusty, it actually makes great mud. Elephants love to bathe in the dust and mud, and they turn the shore into an island spa. Their skin is tough but sensitive. Dust helps rid it of parasites, and mud holds moisture to it cooling the elephants as it dries out. This treatment is a welcome respite from the mid-afternoon sun. It's also good fun. Even big old bulls enjoy the benefits of the spa. This youngster is not so sure about the soothing qualities of the sticky mud. It prefers to seek the cool shade only to be found under its mother. The spa's benefits aren't confined to the elephants. Warthogs also enjoy sticky suits of mud. Dust bathing can go right over your head if you're too young to cope with headwinds. And this tiny calf is left out altogether. It's too young to control its trunk properly. It can't wait to get out of the heat and into the shady woodlands. The spa is left open for the smaller animals to enjoy. This sycamore fig tree is also the scene of some health treatments. 
some baboons engage in grooming. while other members of the troop are more interested in what's on offer above. Fat green marulas. Chief's Island is wreathed in fruit trees. They provide a nutritious addition to the baboon's varied diet. The fruit trees also sustain many other animals, like birds and fruit bats. Fruit bats may eat as many as 20 figs a night each. but the benefits of fruit are still unknown to this suckling baby baboon. Baboons benefit from many of the island's habitats, forest, floodplain and grasslands. But they're always wary of danger and post lookouts to protect their troop. The lookout's barking is triggered by the arrival of a lioness in the grasslands. Different lions hunt at different times of the day. Many will hunt at night, but this female chooses the late afternoon as the heat begins to subside. The baboon seems very bold but he's not putting himself in any danger. He maintains his distance from the lion and would escape into a tree if she got closer. His alarm calls are reducing her chances of surprising any prey. The object of her intention comes into view, a herd of wildebeest. They've seen her and quickly assess the danger. While she's still, they slowly file on. She's not alone. The wildebeest are alert, primed by the baboon's calls, and easily escape. Perhaps tonight, when the baboons are asleep, 
the lion's chances will be better. There's only an hour of daylight left until dusk. With sundown approaching, the wild dogs are getting frisky and eager to hunt. They have a lot of mouths to feed. They greet each other with face licks and rally round the pack. If left undisturbed, wild dogs seldom change dens while rearing young. But something, maybe a lion, has disturbed this pack and now they must move their puppies to another den. The puppies are very vulnerable in the open. And the changeover has to be quick. Older pups run with the pack. But the younger ones are carried by mouth. Protection of the pups is paramount, and adults regularly stop for stragglers. The cheetah has heard the distress calls of the puppies. It knows better than to approach the pack, but could pick off a straggler. And the smaller puppies do seem to have a problem keeping up. But nothing is that simple for cheetahs. The dogs have spotted it. And the little puppy knows when it's time to run for cover. Wild dogs are one of the fastest land predators and are on the cheetah's tail in no time. But they abandon the chase. Daylight is fading and they must get the puppies to the new den before dark. The guardian sees they're safely underground and stands over the den's entrance. The puppies are very excited after their excursion and the guardian will have a hard time keeping them down. Elephants consume vast quantities of vegetation each day and may spend up to 18 hours foraging. In the wooded areas of the island, they can feed on roots, creepers, bark, and leaves. Another dust raker is making use of the cooler evening. The honey badger forages for insects and grubs in the dusty Kalahari sand. A successful kill brings the large pack into the grasslands. The elephants will spend the night foraging in the woods. Wild dogs can strip a carcass in a few minutes and soon devour most of the kill. Hyenas are respectful of the dogs while they're feeding. The dogs are fast and have needle-sharp teeth and will set about the hyenas if they're interrupted. The pack will return to the puppies when the sun goes down, 
but the hyenas have the whole night to feed. Even so, one of the bolder hyenas can't resist a quick recce. And the dog's tolerance evaporates. Chief's Island has witnessed conflicts like these for thousands of years, as predators pursue prey and compete with each other in an endless game of survival. This is a rich but rare paradise, isolated by the watery wilderness of the Delta. Its fortune lies in this isolation. Let's hope that its recent discovery by tourism does not endanger the beating heart of the Okavango. Botswana is a dry country. It is dominated by the Kalahari, flat, dusty, endless. For most of the year, its surface is without water. So, water is priceless. It forces domesticated and wild animals to compete. The barren Bateti River forms the western boundary of the Makadikadi Basin, a vast sea of arid grasslands and salt pans. Makadikadi is a land of extremes. When the rains come, the salt pans fill with water and prairie-like grasslands are renewed. Southern Africa's greatest free-ranging herds of wildebeest and zebra spread out across the basin and memories of the drought evaporate on the cool breeze. The Okavango River rises in the highlands of Angola and eventually flows into northwest Botswana. It is the last of the great rivers still to flow into the ancient lake basin of Makarikari. The giant river transforms the Kalahari into fertile swamplands but never reaches the sea. Most of the water evaporates or is swallowed by the sand. The river breaks into many channels that fan out to form an inland delta. Only one channel escapes the delta and flows into the Kalahari beyond, the Bateti Channel. Most years, a tiny percentage of flood water makes it to the channel. Sometimes, nothing at all. This region of Botswana is the bed of one of Africa's greatest ancient lakes, Makarikadi. The Boteti Channel connects the Okavango Delta to the vast Makarikadi soda pans, where the ancient lake finally disappeared. Today, the only regular water supply into this region comes from the Okavango. The water hasn't reached beyond the delta in the last seven years, and the last pools in the channel are slowly drying up. This herd of hippopotamus watches their pool shrink year on year, waiting for the floods to come. Now they rely on the government tanker to keep their wallow wet. But it's not just hippos that need water. Small villages surrounding the channel also rely on its supply. Thornbush fences help protect the villagers' wells from wandering wildlife. Dark spots on the hippo's skin reveal escaping sweat. 
Hippos lose a great deal of water through their skin and must stay cool in the heat of the day. If the hole dries up, they'll have to move on or die. From the air, a mosaic of wells shows the impact of the villagers and their animals on the dusty bed of the channel. The marabou stork feeds on carrion. For this bird, drought is a time of plenty. All life in the channel is in search of water. Wild and domesticated animals are forced into uneasy and unnatural association. Storks scavenge the dried up pools, feeding on the remains of stranded catfish. There's plenty of carrion to be found in these desperate times. Villagers can access water beneath the channel from their wells, but their protective thornbush fences are not always effective. During the night, two young hippos fell into a well, drawn by the prospect of fresh water. So has a cow. The cow was pregnant and gave birth on top of the hippos. The farmer and officials are desperate to at least save the calf. Cattle are a symbol of wealth, and farmers can't afford to lose them to the wells. The hippos must be under great stress, but fortunately for everyone, they remain calm. Wildlife officials are keen to see that the hippos are safely released, and the farmer needs to get them out of the well before he can release his cow. The pressure on these wild animals must be intolerable. But survival takes precedence over everything else. The government decided to withdraw the tanker in the hope that the hippos would move back to the swamp 60 miles away. But the hippos remained, sustained by natural water seepage and limited grass nearby. Once the surface water was gone, the competition with domestic animals ceased. <coughs> A few seepage pools scattered along the 250 miles of the Batetis dry channel are all that's left of previous floodwaters. Remarkably, this pool is home to a large Nile crocodile and a saddlebill stork. Each year, the fish are concentrated into a smaller and smaller area, and the stork has an easy time picking them off. The crocodile has survived for seven years, waiting for the river to return. During this time, it has protected itself in a deep burrow it has dug in the bank. Occasionally, it catches a meal at the edge of the pool. These impala have come down from the Makadikadi National Park. Any surface water draws in wildlife from a very wide area.
nowhere in the Bateti is free of cattle. This is the only permanent surface water for thousands of square miles, and people depend on it. But at this point, the riverbed forms a boundary between the national park on the east and the villagers' lands in the west. The unmarked boundary runs down the middle of the channel. In times of drought, animals must be resourceful and sometimes adopt unusual tactics to survive. Amazingly, a cave high up the bank is littered with hippopotamus dung. The hippo must have struggled up the bank to shade itself from the sun once its pool had dried. But without water, the hippo couldn't survive for long. Not far away, there is a pool that still has water, but it's barely fit for life. The blood red color comes from algae that thrives on hippo dung, but poisons the water. Nothing else can live in it or drink it. Desert adapted sand grass specialize in dry areas, but still need fresh water to drink. They'll fly up to 50 miles in search of a clean pool, no matter how small. While they're here, they soak special absorbent breast feathers in the water to carry droplets back to their chicks in the desert. As the channel runs alongside the park towards the Makadi Kadi salt pans, the seepage pools become few and far between until they disappear altogether. Great seas of arid grassland lie between the channel and the salt pans. These grasslands support massive free-ranging herds of grazers, especially wildebeest and zebra. In the dry season, the herds are forced to live along the edge of the channel because it provides their only source of water. They visit it in their thousands, a few hundred descending at a time to drink. The Bateti is a lifeline for most of the large grazing animals of the Makadikadi National Park. Even though its sandy riverbed offers little, these grazers have no other choice. Scavengers follow the wanderings of the grazers as the drought takes its toll. In the channel, the concentration of animals provides a captive audience. Competition for water becomes intense, even amongst the wild herds. Water seeps into some pools so slowly that wildebeest must pause between each sip. It's a grim existence that worsens every year the river fails. It is amazing that tens of thousands of animals are able to survive on such a small supply. Without the vast grasslands, they certainly could not. Cattle are very important to the rural Batswana people. One side of the channel is cattle country, the other, national park. But without a physical boundary, the result is a free for all at the water holes. Like the hippos upstream, the wildebeest live in uneasy unison with domesticated livestock. The wild grazers are timid and find it difficult to compete with domesticated animals for water. Without a boundary or fence to restrict them, 
the cattle also compete for grazing in the national park. There is a new arrival in the blood red pool. A baby hippopotamus nervously swims looking for its mother. It has good cause to be anxious. It is unfamiliar with the other adults. In normal conditions, it would spend the first two weeks of its life hidden from the herd, protected by its mother. But now, it seems confused. Its mother briefly appears and moves her baby away from the herd. But there is nowhere for the mother to hide her calf, which is now approached by an older female. The calf seems desperate for acceptance. Perhaps this behavior is a built-in survival mechanism that is avoided when normal conditions prevail. Three baby hippos have been killed in this way in the last year. In the dry season, the big herds of the Makadikadi concentrate around the few water holes left in the channel. The big predators follow them in. Zebra normally visit at night. They're nervous of man, guns, and domestic animals. But this year, the drought is sufficiently bad to warrant a daytime visit. The lions are ready, night or day. One grazer looks much like another to a lion. They don't differentiate. Predator and prey mix freely without a fence to separate them. And the villagers are not happy with rampaging big cats near their herds. Defense force officials have been called to investigate reports of an aggressive injured lion hanging around the channel. He's a handsome but wild beast and clearly will not cooperate with an inspection, so must be tranquilized first. If his wounds can be treated, he will be translocated within the park away from human settlements. A hole in his fur leads to a hole in his spine. He's been shot and his rear legs are paralyzed. The shooting was probably a reprisal for a cattle kill or perhaps because he was seen too close to livestock. Either way, he has no chance of survival in the wild and is given a lethal injection. When the river flowed, there was at least some degree of separation. But not everything is bleak in the Makadikadi National Park. There is one other place that has permanent water. Far from the Bateti Channel is a haven called Nai Pan, and here a pride of lions lives free from the temptation of cattle. In the center of the pan is a small water hole kept full throughout the year. Water is pumped by the government from the underground aquifer into this tank 
and then to the waterhole via two miles of buried pipeline. Spillage attracts an elephant that is learning a trick or two. It seems the elephant knows that when the tap is turned, the tank overflows. The presence of water year-round allows resident communities to establish at the pan. Springbok do not normally need to drink, but doing so allows them to congregate in much larger herds in the dry season than they would otherwise be able to. The resident grazers are prey for the lions, which have a hard time hunting without cover around the waterhole. But with so many springbok, there is always the chance that one will make a mistake. It's only a matter of when. seems to have no interest in hunting. kill will be shared between the hunters. Or perhaps not. Lions are great opportunists, and it makes sense for the male to use his strength claiming the kill, rather than exhausting it hunting on the plains. There won't be much left after he's finished, so the females must hunt again. He takes his meal to the shade of some thorn trees, where he can enjoy it at his leisure. The females are not disheartened. Day sun defeats them, but the springbok aren't going anywhere.
Although there is a small water hole in the middle of Naipan, the rest of the pans are dry and dusty. Strong breezes soon whip the dust into the air and dull the rays of the sun. There's little to do in a dust storm except to wait for it to blow itself out. But these winds are different. There's a change in the air and the animals can sense it. Winds a hundred miles to the east cross Suapan, the largest sea of soda in Makhadi Khadi. The winds are heading westward across the park. They herald the arrival of the rains and the long-awaited end of the dry season. change in atmosphere is palpable. Rain will transform Makarikari and bring a short but intense season of plenty. It's as if the lions know what good times are about to come and celebrate their imminent arrival. Renewed grazing will bring good times for the springbok too. Rains fall sporadically as they head across the plains. At last, the long suffering hippos are freed from their tombs of caked mud. The ground softens, and every hoof print becomes a drinking cup. When the moon is up and the air is cool, the hippos ease themselves from their wallows for the last time. They can now leave the Bateti Channel and travel through the damp night towards the far-off waters of the Okavango Delta. The rains fall erratically across the park, and the lower reaches of the Bateti Channel are still dry. Grasslands around the channel are parched, but zebra are already leaving the Bateti and heading out over the plains. Wildebeest also leave by the thousand, even though there is no sign of water. Somehow they know that pans are filling, that sweet, fresh water is waiting in the grasslands. Rains falling far to the east trigger this mass movement. Whether the grazers can hear low frequencies of thunder or smell the rain is not known. But in one day, they all head directly towards the pans, a hundred miles away. Something sends them on this journey into the great seas of grass. And the lions follow.
the lions are forced to be as nomadic as the grazers. Almost all their prey has left the channel and they can avoid human harassment by leaving too. These are the greatest naturally occurring herds of wildebeest and zebra in southern Africa. Lions have little effect on their numbers. This is a journey the grazers make every year the rains come, and they can't wait to escape into the park. For the first time in seven months, they can drink unaccompanied by man or cattle. Sweet water can be found amongst the salt at the broken fringes of the great pans. And as if from nowhere, streams of flamingos arrive, stopping off on their way to their breeding grounds in the largest pan. Thousands upon thousands of flamingos and pelicans head for the Great Pan in the east of Makadikari. At the same time, the herds of grazers head towards the western edge of the pans and to Naipan in the north, where they join wandering elephants. The sight and smell of the fresh water excites the herds. Zebra and wildebeest blaze trails across the Makadi Kadi National Park. Once they're out in the open, they're finally safe. Man and his animals can't follow the herds out here. They will raise their young in the isolation of the vast grasslands. The salt pans are the largest in the world, and rain transforms them into thousands of square miles of soda lakes. A few special places are ideal for the breeding birds, where the pans are shallow, isolated, and free from predators. When the conditions are right, pelicans colonize the northern end of Suapan, where fish are washed into the lake from the newly connected rivers. They gather in their tens of thousands to feed, mate, and raise their young before the shallow lake evaporates. The southern part of the pan is a mecca for all of southern Africa's flamingos. They arrive from the Atlantic coast of Namibia, the soda lakes of the East African Rift Valley, and possibly as far as the Indian Ocean hundreds of thousands of them. This is the only regular breeding site for the flamingos of southern Africa. And like the herds of grazers, they seem to know the rains are falling and time their arrival perfectly. Rains have transformed the Makarikari Basin from a sea of soda to a vision of its shimmering past. Grass grows quickly in the lush plains that surround the new soda lakes.
These baobab trees stand like sentinels at the edge of the pans. They may have witnessed this annual transformation for the past thousand years. And some animals have made the annual journey across the plains for even longer. Adventurous bull elephants succumb to their wanderlust and follow old pathways across the plains to the renewed grasslands. They leave family groups of mothers and calves behind, attracted here by the grass, palm fruit and isolation. Large herds of zebra start to arrive in the rich grasslands of Naipan. The pan is now dotted with numerous water holes, and the animals no longer rely on the water pumped by the government. The wet season has inundated Makhadi Khadi and Nai Pan with wildlife, ready to take advantage of this time of plenty. The animals can graze and drink with ease and their spirits seem to be lifted by their brief time in the transformed pans. In a display called pronking, Springbok seem to kick the dust off their dry hooves. become skittish in the cool, moist air, trying each other out for size, testing their strength. They enjoy life in Makhadikari. Zebra time most of their foaling for the wet season. Those born now benefit from the abundance of food and from termite mounds that make wonderful belly scratches. This female lion is in the mood for mating and solicits the dominant male. But this young male tries to take advantage while the dominant male is distracted. The dominant male will not tolerate any others mating in his pride. It won't be long before the young offender is driven out permanently. An adult zebra goes a lot further than a little springbok, when it comes to feeding, that is. Some female lions switch their attention to the newly arrived big game. Lions hide strategically in the long grass to ambush zebra, shepherded their way. This tactic only pays off if the zebra run in the right direction. Luckily, they have. But they're too fast for the lions. The 
the male just watches and waits. A herd of zebra pursuing a pride of lions appears strange. But the lions are busy drinking, and with their backs in full view, there's no room for surprise. And perhaps the zebra are just curious. The male is back to his habit of hijacking kills. This time, he's robbed a leopard's larder. Pulling the kill down from the tree takes little effort compared to hunting, so he's not going to give up easily. Half a kill is better than none, and much better than exertions in the heat. Smaller predators live alongside the large. The trotting fox-like animal is a black-backed jackal. While there are no other predators around the waterhole, the jackal takes a chance. Jackals scavenge or hunt small mammals. They're great opportunists, but only the black-backed hunts animals as large as springbok. To prime himself, he settles into a heap of elephant dung, perhaps to disguise his smell. This trick seems hardly worthwhile when he remains so visible in the open country. lunge scatters the adults, but surprises the youngster caught up in the mud. The prize must be taken quickly, lest an idle male lion is on the prowl. Tawny eagles pose no threat to the springbok. Even their lambs are too big for it to catch. So why is this one intent on moving the eagle along? Perhaps it's just for fun. Some of the smaller pans are already drying up when thousands of finches flock in to drink. Some young Lana falcons and their parents eagerly watch them. The finches are red-billed quailia, and the sheer numbers of them drinking means that many fledglings become waterlogged. And the lanners are waiting.
It's time for target practice. Lanners, like all falcons, are fast, agile hunters that specialize in taking other birds. The floundering quailia give the young falcons a head start with their hunting skills. But holding on is another skill altogether. Quelia feed on the abundant seed in the open grasslands, which they share with burrowing meerkats. Meerkats don't need to drink and can live in the grasslands year round, unlike the migrating quelia, wildebeest, and zebra. Only a few inches high, the meerkat baby is on its first sortie out of the den. It has a lot to learn. It takes a while to master the surprised stance of the lookout. The lana is on the attack again. It's not interested in the adults, but it could be tempted by the youngster. And the baby hasn't mastered walking yet, let alone fleeing. These are idle threats. Ants respond to the short-lived bounty and harvest the ripe grass seeds. After collecting the seeds, they sort them, literally separating the wheat from the chaff, then store them in their underground larder, ready for the dry season to come. Ants and termites will eat more grass and seed than all the quelia and the grazers put together. The vast grasslands attract colossal flocks of quelia. But when the water runs out, they're forced to move on. The time of plenty is short-lived, and animals make the most of it by feeding almost continuously. Already, there's a change in the air. Zebra hooves raise telltale clouds of dust on the plain. The water birds have raised their young and graced the soda lakes for the last time this year.
flocks of flamingos begin to stream away from the pans. Empty nests crust the pan as soda crystals begin to break through the retreating pools. When the water is too salty to drink, the herds of grazers know it's time to leave. Time to leave behind fast fading memories of sweet water pans and trudge back to the harsh realities of the Bateti in the far west. With their numbers reinforced by new foals, the grazers can afford the odd casualty. Already, the Makadi Kadi is unrecognizable, but all too familiar. But pelicans heading for the Okavango can see new signs of hope. This year, floodwaters are flowing from the Okavango into the Bateti Channel. They've traveled further than they have for seven years. While they've still not reached the park, perhaps they signal the beginning of a wetter time. Meanwhile, plans are afoot to keep wildlife and cattle separate and bring benefits to both communities. If the floods are strong, then perhaps the river will form a major boundary for the Makadikadi National Park once again. <laughs>